Welcome everyone to December 2020 Boise ITSM meeting. I know it's been a few months since we've had a meeting. It's been a busy fall and wrap up to the year. Really appreciate all of you being here and appreciate Michael Cardinal, our speaker, for being willing to come to deliver a session for us today. Got a chance to see Michael again here at the conference for the service management world this last month in Orlando. Uh, Marshall, I know, was there and got to spend some great time with him and uh, we really had a nice conference. So I appreciate Michael being willing to come and present to our group today. I'm going to quickly share my screen and just have a little bit of our intro deck to go through before I hand it over to Michael and to get us started. Let's see a couple more working their way in. Welcome, everyone. Okay. So first off, we like to just say thanks to everyone for taking the time out of your day to attend our virtual meeting for December. Appreciate Michael being here and being our presenter today, and I'll introduce him as well. And for any first timers that we have, we absolutely want to make sure we have time at the end to have you introduce yourself. So welcome to everyone who's maybe new to the group or maybe hasn't been here in a little while. Appreciate all of you being here as well. I always like to introduce the meeting and introduce myself. I'm Jeff Jensen. I'm president and founder or co-founder of the Boise ITSM group. Our other co-founder, Ryan Holzer, is also here. Appreciate Ryan being here this month. Glad he could make it. We're here in this meeting to try and create a vision of delivering actionable information through our presentations and, of course, to encourage attendee participation. We definitely want to make sure we have some time for some Q&A and some good discussion at the end of our presentations. And we're really here to help inspire all of you to continue to learn, to continue to grow your knowledge, to become better IT leaders, and to continue to fill the IT service management void that we see in a lot of our organizations, as well as in our communities. Today's presentation, welcome to our special guest speaker, speaker Michael Cardinal, who is the director of the BPMO Americas region for Thirdera. I'll let him talk about his role a little bit more in Thirdera in just a minute. His presentation is on effective questioning for ITSM, which I'm very interested to learn more about that perspective. Michael and I have known each other for over nine years now. It's been a great relationship. I really appreciate the opportunity to have known him throughout the years. And he was my instructor for my ITIL V3 Managing Across the Lifecycle class that you take as the final class for ITIL Expert. And that was back when we were doing almost all of our trainings in person. I was in Fort Lauderdale for that. And it was the last class that Michael Todd, I believe, for ITSM Academy before he moved, yep. got back into being part of the consulting world. And uh, since that time, we've been able to stay in touch, attend conferences together and spend time. And I just really appreciate uh, all of the information and the wealth of knowledge I've gained from being associated with Michael. I'm super excited to have him be here. So Michael, welcome. And please go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more. And then I'll give you uh, the ability to share and lead us into your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've known actually some of you on this call for quite a long time. Uh, so thanks for this opportunity. And where this kind of came about was Jeff and I were at the Service Management World Conference and the keynote was mentioning uh, questioning and Jeff had asked me about, you know, potentially presenting and it just occurred to me, hey, I, I've this is a passion of mine and this is something that I've done before and talked about before so uh, this would be a great opportunity to kind of bring this back to life a little bit and uh, introduce it to people again. Uh, so, as Jeff said, uh, I am the director of the BPMO, our business process management office at Thurdera for all of the Americas. That is of as of last Friday. So I got consolidated team now uh, as of Friday. And I told Jeff, yes, I asked for that. I'm I'm kind of dumb that way. Uh, but uh, Thurdera is we're a ServiceNow partner, and um, I kind of handle all of that process stuff uh, really globally, since most of our folks are here in the Americas. Because I control the America's teams, but it's really a global effort. Uh, some of you may know some of our uh, early, we're really a conglomerate of companies that came together, Evergreen and Cerna and Novoscale and several others. So uh, just really in that service now space, don't want to harp on that too much. But uh, so we're, we're a couple of years old as third era, but a long time doing this work. So um, that's about me. I got a little bit more in the deck about me, Jeff, so we can okay. kind of go in. Stop sharing and go ahead and let you take control. All right. Um, 
Oh, you need to enable screen sharing for me. Okay, sorry, I thought I'd done that, but that might have been in our other session. Yeah, I think that was in the other session. Okay, here we go. How about now? And there we go. Okay. All right, so effective questioning for ITSM. Many, many years ago in a previous life, I was an educator. I spent a good 20 plus years as an adjunct professor, adjunct instructor uh, at college, kind of doing that in the evenings while I was working IT stuff during the day. And out of that came this idea of um, some soft skill work, right, of how do we get people in IT to kind of be better at who they are in terms of uh, how they work. There were so many people talking about things like configuration management and change management and and all those. And I was looking for a way to kind of give back to the industry and to people and this idea of bringing this kind of soft skill uh, forward really was something that uh, hit me. And uh, I did um, a version of this early on in about 2011, I think it was at one of the service management conferences. And um, I think it's it's just as important today as it was back then. I think it's a skill that people assume people have, but no one, uh, I, I can't imagine too many, if anyone on the call has ever sat down and been shown or taught how to phrase a question, how to put a question together, especially around ITSM. So that's what we're trying to do today is really give you some practical hints and tips about uh, how to put questioning together, how to use good questioning to get more effective service management. So let me make sure I can click forward on here. All right, so me, I'm director of the Americas. Yeah, so I go way back. I started my service management ITIL journey in 97 with really version one uh, through to version two uh, service manager expert, now version four or it's not version four, ITIL four managing professional, but I've also done uh, CPDE out of ITSM Academy, if you're familiar with that. Like I said, uh, I'm an educator and really... Uh, Am I a man for all seasons? In some ways, I think I am. And there's a reason I put a question mark behind that, because that kind of is what we're going to talk about is what qualifies a good question, right? And how do you phrase and put together a good question? All right, so hopefully today we will get through all of these. Um, so getting to understand questions better. Right? Are we gonna Are we gonna do that? Uh, are we gonna talk about questioning approaches? Uh, are we gonna talk about question development? Are we gonna talk about using questions for ITSM? And then the big famous question: Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So to know whether or not we have succeeded in this journey. If you have questions, put them in a chat or save them to the end. We'll have some time for questions then as well. So why, why do we need to be more effective with questioning and service management? Well, first of all, questions serve really as the basis of all of ITSM. It helps you kind of, and, and this is a little bit old school, but I think these this life cycle idea still works, right? That there is this flow from an idea, strategy, or a concept or a vision that you want all the way through to making it work, making it happen, uh, to continually improving it. And good questions are the way that you make that life cycle work. Without the questions, you don't really get to lead to the next point. And that's really why we want to have better questions to help us move through the whole life cycle of services, the whole life cycle of providing support, whether you're using the value chain idea or the value stream idea of, out of V4 or still kind of using the life cycle idea out of the V3, still works with good questions. Questions are the basis of good communication. So here are three things that questions really help you do. They help you explore possibilities, right, and generate new ideas. They help you to uh, identify opportunities, what's next, to narrow options and to really hone in on good scope. And they help you to make decisions through action. So questions really uh, are that key to good communications better thought, better thinking. The, the core of critical thinking is questioning, 
right? And that's all thought is really a matter of asking and responding to questions, whether that is externally or in your head. Uh, it helps you to be more effective, efficient, economical, and even effortless, and ultimately can drive better utility and warranty, right? Which is the formula for value. So ultimately questions, good questions can help you do all of these things. All right, so let's start out with some definitions. What are questions? So what is a question? Well, a question, here's a basic definition of a question, a sentence worded or expressed to elicit data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. What kinds of things do we use for question or what types of questions can we use or, or how can we make use of questions? Well, we can use them in some of the ways that I just talked about, right? the benefits to ITSM, but we can probe, we can uh, generate ideas, we can understand things better, we can determine relevance, uh, accuracy, we can gather information and examples, extend our knowledge, elicit emotions, all of these are good ways ways in which we can uh, use questions and questions help us to do all of these things. So questions aren't just really yes or no, and we'll talk about the, that more, but they're really ways that we can get all of these things in place, especially for service management. And people don't often think about some of these things, but these are really, uh, there's a broad use of questioning and uh, effective structures of questions that can help us in many, many ways. All right, so what type of questions can we have, right? A question is not just yes and no, I just talked about that, or what we call an opened or closed question. Uh, questions can be in the form of probing. So you can probe in a question. You can inquire. There are Socratic questioning. Uh, anybody uh, have an idea or can describe for us what a Socratic question is? So what I just did was a Socratic question, <laughs> right? By asking you what what is a Socratic question? I just gave a an example of a Socratic question. So Socrates, right, the famous uh, philosopher, he would never answer anyone with a straight answer. He'd always answer with another question, and that's a great questioning technique. So rather than give someone an answer, uh, you can do things like, well, what do you think the answer is? That's Socratic questioning. Okay, coaching. So using questions to kind of get people down the road and things. Open, close, those are those yes, no versus more full bodied kind of questions, rhetorical uh, interview type questions, survey, and then all of those levels of thinking, right? Str strategic, tactical, operational question types range in usage, in structure, but we do have a, a bit of a formula that I'm going to give you that can help you with uh, this kind of thing. But a, a question that comes to mind as I think or talk about these question types is, what about Bloom's questions? Where on this list are Bloom's questions? And some of you may know what I'm referring to. Others may not know what I'm referring to here. Um, but it is a good question, right? We've got all these different kinds of question types up here, but I don't mention anything about Bloom. And uh, the reason for that is I want to talk more about Bloom. I just wanted to introduce some of the different question types that are out there, but I do want to spend a good chunk of time talking about Bloom's questions. Now, if you've ever taken an ITIL class, you may be familiar with this guy's name, uh, Benjamin Bloom. So Benjamin Bloom, you can see here in the corner, he was an educational psychologist in the 1900s, and he really did the landmark work and research around how someone learns and masters something. So before Bloom, people really focused on learning as rote memorization, right? And what Bloom realized is two things. First, they needed a better definition in the world around what is knowledge. So when someone says, I know something, or someone says, I'm an expert, or they are a master of something, what does that mean? And then second of all, how do you achieve that? 
And so he kind of set out this definition of knowledge as mastery of three domains, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. And from this derives all learning in the universe. So if you've ever been in any kind of class anywhere, whether that is in a preschool class, a kindergarten class, a middle school, high school, college, post-college, work training, all of that learning is really based on Bloom's work, right? So this is how people actually learn and master things. Uh, if you've ever had homework to do, that is a result of Bloom. If you've ever had to do experiments, that is because of Bloom. If you've ever had to write um, research papers or you've had to write uh, lab reports, that's because of Bloom, All right? So with this definition, then, he said, how do you achieve this mastery of these domains? Well, in particularly, he focused a lot on the cognitive domain, and that's the one that we're going to focus on today for questioning. And what he did was he built a model that says, basically, you cannot go from knowing nothing about a subject to knowing everything about it in one leap. You actually have to build on that. And how do you build or move through these steps? Through questioning. So what we can do is take Bloom's ideas and we can apply Bloom's model, not just to learning, but how to build effective questionings. And you can really apply Bloom in so many different situations and use it as a model. And we'll talk about some of those as they relate to service management, but use that as a model to go through and build effective questioning. All right. As I said, if you've ever taken an ITIL class, you might be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy because this is the basis of every ITIL class out there. Uh, so there are six levels to the model, if you're familiar with it. If you're not, you'll see the six levels here. We start at the bottom with knowledge and we work our way up to evaluation. And you can see the way that the ITIL classes at least have been laid out. You can also do this with most other organizational classes as well. So at the bottom, you're going to have your foundation classes, which are just going to stay at those knowledge and comprehension levels. Then your more advanced classes like your, what is it, DIP and DSV and all of those are going to be in your more advanced middle layers. And then when you get up to things like ITIL expert, managing professional, you're going to get to those highest layers. So in a real world situation, here's how this works. Let's say I am a science teacher. And I'm going to try and teach you something like chemistry. I would start at the bottom with basic definitions. Here's a beaker. Here is a chemical. Here is what a molecule is. Here is what a compound is. From there, I would go on to level two. Can you use those terms in a sentence, right? The beaker is made of glass, right? That is comprehending what a beaker is based on its definition and what it's what it's comprised of. I would then have you do an experiment at level three that I set up. Fill the beaker, boil the liquid, see what's left, those kind of things. At level four, I would have you light, write a lab report. What did you find from that uh, application? At level five, I would have you come up with an experiment. So you develop a thesis, you develop a uh, hypothesis, and you determine whether uh, what needs to be experimented. And then at level six, I would have you evaluate that experiment and tell me how well it went. Okay, and then use that to convince me of your thesis. Right. So that's kind of a real world uh, situation. So what we can do is take Bloom's taxonomy and use it to build questions in service management. So how do we do that? So what we do is we recognize that as a set of questioning uh, forms or questioning models, we start with questions at the bottom level and we work up towards the top as we go from very objective questions to very subjective. So when you set up questioning, you should always start at the bottom and use level one for information gathering. Then at level two, you would add on to those information gathering questions by confirming or translating what you just got in terms of answers into more questions. 
then at level three, you would take those that confirmation and you would turn that into gathering even more data or making use of that data that you had, turning that information or that data from data into information and starting to turn it into knowledge. And we'll talk about that in just a second here. Then at level four, we would kind of deconstruct what we're finding in terms of questions and be able to understand better why things are working the way that they are. Then at level five, we would form questions that would bring those things back together in new ways. And then at level six, we would determine whether things were working well or not. Right. So this is how we use Bloom is we go from very objective yes or no type or factual type questions to very uh, formative, evaluative uh, kind of questions at level six. At the bottom, facts are facts. They don't they're not right or wrong. They just are at level six, whether I think something is true and whether you all think something is true. That's really the question up at level six is, right, can we show that kind of thing? All right, so what do we do with that? Well, in terms of service management, what we do is use the DIKW cycle uh, constructed with Bloom. And what we get is a set of conversion capabilities using questions. So what we can do is gather data in knowledge management. We can then convert that data into information. We can take the information through questioning and convert it to knowledge. We can convert the knowledge into wisdom. As we do this, what we're doing is moving from very narrow pieces of data, bits and bytes, to a very broad picture of how things exist. And good questioning allows us to get more and more information and more and more knowledge and better wisdom as we move up. And again, you can't jump from knowing nothing about something all the way up to wisdom. You have to move through the DIKW cycle. So Bloom ties in and aligns uh, very nicely with the DIKW cycle from knowledge management. All right, so how do we do this, right? So if that's what we're going to do, how do we do it? Well, what we do is we take each of those levels, whether that's level one knowledge or level six evaluation, and we form questions that help us to move from, from level to level, right? Or get answers from level to level. And what Bloom has done is saved us all a whole lot of time. And you can go out and Google Bloom's question words and you can get just stacks of questions or question words out there. Uh, I've given you an example. So when you ask questions like who, what, where, when about things and the answer is very factual, then you are asking a knowledge type question. Uh, if you use the term, can you, or if you say identify X or state X, again, you're very factual. There's not a right or wrong. It just is. As you move up, you'll see that there's a different set of questions. Some get reused, but most of them are pretty unique to each level. And as you use these question words, you are moving from very factual operational type activities to those big picture strategy kind of picture uh, ideas. So what you can do is build questions using these term or using these words that then drive you towards that bigger picture. Right? So you can start with some very operational things and drive or derive, I should say, a strategy from that. All the while then using these questions also for continual improvement. So how do we make use of Bloom's question words? Well, we need a set of helper words to make greatest use of these, right? And without these helper words, it can be often difficult to phrase effective questions just out of Bloom's words. So what we can do is take one or we can take from one of two sets of words, couple those together with Bloom's uh question words and get an effective question. So how do we do that? So we take what's known as a modal verb. And if you've ever studied languages, you may be familiar with this term. A modal verb is a verb that shows possibility or opportunity or action, 
right? So those three things that I started with, it's words like can, may, ought, shall, should, those kind of things. Then you can also use what are known as the journalistic questions, which many of you are probably familiar with. Who, what, where, when, how, why, right? So now I have two elements. I have a sort of um, mastery type word in the form of Bloom's words. I have a helper word in terms of forming an effective question. What do I do with these two things? Well, what I do with these two things is I bring them together in this formula. All right. So the first thing I want to do when writing a good question is determine what level of the Bloom's taxonomy am I attempting to get information? Am I simply trying to get facts? Then I want to ask a question at level one. If I'm trying to understand how someone is applying something, then I would ask at level three. If I'm looking to understand how someone is evaluating something, I would ask at level six. So what I would do is I would take a helper word from the list I just showed you. I'd couple that with a Bloom question word, and then I'd give it a context. And in this case, the context is service management. Now, this context could be whatever you want, right? Uh, in education, we could use it to uh, a context of history, of math, of science, of art, of whatever it is, right? In business, there's lots of context, finance and accounting and process and other things. For, for this context in this presentation, the context of service management. And so what I've done is given you some examples of how you would write those questions. Okay, so an effective question would be take my helper word like can, right, which shows me ability. I would then add in a Bloom's question word, in this case, describe, and then I would give it context, incident. So an effective question in service management would be, can you describe the incident? That is much more effective than a question like, what happened? Right? What happened is so broad, so big, people often have, have hard time uh, answering those kind of questions. What this form does is allow you to narrow in on whether you're looking for possibility, ability, permission, those kind of things, helps you to identify a particular level of response or knowledge that you're trying to achieve, and gives you a specific context, right? So you have other examples here. How would you identify utility? How would you, how could you, we create a better strategy? Will we comprehend the impact of the change? These are much more effective questions and will get you much better answers or results than those broad based questions that we tend to ask. Like I said, like, what happened? What were you doing? Um, you know, why did you do that? Right. Too many, first of all, too many uh, pronouns in there uh, because someone may not know what that is. Right. They don't have a specific context to it. You don't know which level you're trying to achieve. So you don't really have a sense of what answer you're expecting because the question is very broad. And you don't you've not given someone that idea of am I looking for permission, possibility, ability, uh, capability, those kind of things. All right. All right. So what do we do with this information? Well, we need to think about it a little bit and think uh, about how to make use of it. So let's talk about some points to ponder here. First of all, when you're forming these questions, complex is not the same as elaborate. We often think these things are the same or confuse them. Uh, a complex question is not an elaborate question. So you can see I can form a very simple level six or evaluative kind of question, but keep it very simple, right? Not, not make it very difficult. Do you work for a good boss? That's an evaluative question, right? As opposed to a very elaborate level one question, which is really trying to get just basic facts. So can you tell me all the different types of standard changes, standard services, service requests, and events your organization has identified? I'm not looking for 
evaluation here. I'm not looking for application. I'm just looking for a list. And that's a knowledge, that's a level one type question. Even though it sounds very complex and fancy and lots of words, it's a very simple question, right? The other thing we have to remember when talking about good questions is a question is the part with the question mark, right? So as I, as I state here, is this a statement or is it a question? And too often, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine when you have people like, I have a question, and then they go on to make a statement. Well, that's because they're not understanding the difference between a statement and a question, right? Statement is not trying to elicit data, information, knowledge, or wisdom. It's trying to make a point, right? So by using this sort of formula and using helper words and Bloom's words and context, we can really clarify what our question is. A couple other things, right? When you ask a question, the other part of good effective questioning is not simply the formula that I gave you, but what is it that you're expecting out of the answer? If you already know what the answer is, are you really asking a question or are you just having someone validate your thinking, right? And instead of asking a question, you probably should just make a statement of validate my thinking because that's really what you're looking for, right? So if you already know the answer to the question, why are you asking it, right? So what are you using the question for and if you think you know an answer, are you really willing to hear the answer? And a lot of people aren't. Sometimes people aren't willing to hear the answer because it may not be the answer that they already think in their head. So just think about that question. Why am I asking this question in the first place? The other thing is people always talk about open and closed. In reality, there is no such thing as a closed question. There is no true yes or no answer. There is yes, but yes, and no, but no, and these kind of things. There's always something behind the yes or the no. Uh, and as a result of that, even when you ask those kind of closed questions, be ready to generate even more questions. Okay, so that's where those helper words, especially the journalistic words can come in. So if someone says, you know, a, a yes answer to a question, you may want to say, uh, you know, so why is that happening, right? Which should in your brain lead you to problem management, right? So why is that question that kind of leads you to problem management? That's another good use of questioning is that it takes you from one process context to the next process context very smoothly. All right, so let's talk about some examples and usages of these various levels, okay? So the first level here is knowledge and who might make great use of these kind of questions? Well, your service desk, your operational people, because they're very factual. And a lot of times that's what your service desk and operational people need is I just need the facts. I don't need a dissertation or an evaluation kind of level or something higher. I don't need you to create new ideas. I just need to know the facts. And that often relates to things like incidents or service requests, um, you know, config, releases, basic operational type activities. Uh, and certainly these kind of questions come into play when logging. So if you're looking for answer, right, what is, you know, who is calling? Right. That is a basic knowledge kind of question. Where are you located? Uh, is this still your present address? Those kind of questions. Uh, what were the symptoms that you were experiencing? Those are basic kind of questions. Uh, you might also then store that information in places like the CMS, the CMDB data repositories. They call them databases for a reason because they have data. There's no, there's no right or wrong to them. There's no evaluation of them. It's just lots of facts uh, in there. So as I said, this we use this really to gather information about you know, what's going on with an incident or an event, the basic information. This isn't where incident stops. This is where incident begins. And it's by having your service as people practice more effective questions, then you can get better results out of those in, out of that incident uh, response. 
Okay. So as you can see, right, you know, where are you currently located? Or can you tell me where you're currently located? There is that uh, helper word. There is that descriptive Bloom's word in the uh, form of tell. And then context is location, right? So better way of saying that uh, than uh, where are you at? Okay, that could mean a lot of things, right? So those are knowledge questions. Uh, comprehension questions, again, very useful at service desk, but also at second level and then in some of the functions like application management or technical areas or uh, other non-IT kind of functions, those kind of things. They're really helpful in processes like incident and service requests, but also things like access management. And level two is very good when you need to categorize or prioritize things. So actually, when you're asking that prioritization kind of question, you're going beyond that level one to kind of understanding where things sit in the universe, right? That's what level two is really about, is a better understanding of things and a placement of things in the universe so that I can then go on to ask further questions above it. If I don't know where something is in the universe, then I'm going to have a hard time understanding some of those higher level questions or asking some of those higher level questions, All right? So here you can see, can you indicate what were you were doing when the error occurred as opposed to what was going on? Right. Much more formative, much more structured here can. Right. You're asking this person, are they able to tell you or indicate what was going on when the error occurred? You should be able to then get a clear sort of picture. You can further this question with other questions and zoom in on details and you can kind of go, oh, OK, you were trying to print something or you were trying to access something as opposed to the typical thing, which is the printer is broken. Well, how do I know the printer is broken? Let me ask more effective questions, and then I can zoom in on the fact that it's not the printer. It was something that you were doing. All right, application type questions or level questions. These are good up in those functions, you know, for technical people. And uh, again, really good in stages or processes that are related to transition design and deployment. So change and config and release and deployment, those kind of activities. Uh, and this is really how are things, once I know where something, what something is, level one, where it is in the universe, level two, I can understand how it's functioning in that environment. And that's really level three and allows us to kind of see where things are connected and how things are uh, working in that sense. So this is really good when trying to do things like determining workarounds and fixes. So what is the most appropriate way to do this? Not, not necessarily the first way to work around something or to fix something, but the most appropriate way. How can I make this the, the most effective and efficient? So again, here's an example. Could we build the service in a more efficient manner? Again, helper word, uh, Bloom's word in terms of build, and then context is improvement, right? Level four, right? This is where you're starting to really get into some higher level critical thinking, what we call higher order thinking. Your analysts, uh, process owners, those higher level individuals, this is where root cause starts to come in. So problem management is really by its nature, a level four, five, and six process. And you can kind of map the processes into Bloom. Incident, very much a level one through three. Problem, a level four, five, six. And when people ask, you know, well, what's the difference between incident and problem? That's it right there, right? Level one is, or incident is really all about facts and data where uh, level, where problem is really about analysis and evaluation, okay? So, uh, it, you, but you can use it in other processes like change and config and others, right? So this is where you're starting to pull things apart and trying to understand them and understand why they're happening. Uh, a lot of this information or the answers to this information are going to come out of things like data mining and process mining, statistical analysis and statistical tools. Notice we've moved from the CMDB up to the KMDB idea uh, and starting to look broader beyond just the data. 
this helps you to kind of deconstruct things, understand what's making them work, why they're happening. So here we have a, an example. How would we compare the capabilities to distinct services? So I'm really trying to pull them apart to understand what are the similarities and differences between them. Again, my helper word, how, my comparison, compare is a bloom word, and then the capabilities of distinct services is my context. Level five, this is where we start to pull things into new solutions. This is where we go from root cause side of problem management to solutioning, to problem solving side of problem management, uh, as well as things like design and strategy and continual improvement. So this is really where you're going to kind of see where does something sit in the grand universe in the big picture. And you'll notice that we've moved up from the CMDB to the KMDB. Now we're at the SKMS, right, at the Service Knowledge Management System. We're saying, what are all the sources of knowledge that I could bring together and information that I could bring together to help uh, sort of define and design better solutions, better services, new ways of thinking. This is where we, synthesis is really what people refer to as out of the box thinking. And the, the um, keynote that sort of led to this presentation today, uh, he the, the gentleman was talking about instead of thinking about uh, out of the box, build a better box. And that's what synthesis is really about is the when you when you say I'm going to think outside the box, you never really think outside the box, you just expand the existing box. What synthesis is, is throw the old box out and let's get a whole new box, right? Let's think about a better box, a different way of thinking. Uh, somebody I used to know said, uh, people want you to think outside the box, and then they hit you over the head with the box, right? We want to avoid that idea. So here you can see, uh, you know, should we reorganize the IT department to uh, provide more, better, or more efficient uh, service delivery? So again, thinking about new ways of doing things. Let's not be stuck in the past. Let's not just go with what we've known uh, all along. Are there different ways of using this? Uh, and he did this exercise with us uh, in the audience where he's, you know, kind of uh, forced us to think about different usages for a brick, right? So how do we use, you know, people think brick is for building. Uh, you should have, some of the answers were fantastic, we, very interesting ways of reusing a brick. And that's the idea. And then at level six is the, are we there yet? Did we, did we really achieve what we're trying to achieve by thinking differently, right? So this is the kind of thing that you would expect management and strategic people and planners and folks like that to use these kind of questions. And these are great questions to pose during meetings and planning sessions. They force people to think. They force people to get out of their comfort zone. They force people to evaluate how they think, why they think, not just sticking again with sort of the rote memorization or the, or the uh, standard or pat answers that someone might have or a certain definition that they may have in their hand. So it really helps with that value that validation of did I make a good decision? Did I really understand what was happening? Did I really uh, achieve what I was trying to achieve? And again, here you can see, will we be able to predict, predict the effects of an alternative delivery mechanism? So again, my helper word will, prediction is looking into the future. That's a big part of evaluation. Where is this going? Can I project forward? Can I extrapolate or interpolate things beyond what I know today? So that's how we then, some of the uses uh, of those kind of things. But there are more than one way to use Bloom. And some of the things that I suggest you use Bloom is these, right? So meetings. I love to set meeting agendas based on Bloom's taxonomy and the question words. So start a, start a meeting with some basic definitional knowledge type questions, then move all the way through by the end of the meeting, you're asking evaluative questions or evaluation type questions to end the meeting, right? So kind of structure meetings along those levels of questionings. Root cause, again, when you're doing root cause analysis, we talk about things like the five whys, 
uh, and you know fault tree analysis. Another great root cause methodology or that is to set questions based on Bloom's levels. So start out, well, what are the facts about what happened and then move on up to the whys, right? If you start with five whys, sometimes you're skipping all those lower levels, you're jumping to level six type questions. People may not be able to answer those. And I, that's a common thing lately. Um, if you know Donna Knapp, Donna and I have been talking. She's a curriculum developer for uh, ITSM Academy, a good friend, Jeff and I. And she said, you know, that's been happening a lot is people are saying, why do we do root cause? There is no one root cause. Well, that's because we too often try to jump to that why question instead of starting with the basic knowledge questions and moving up to the why questions. Uh, building strategies and plans, right? When you write out a strategy, start with a knowledge or definitional session, section and then move down through to uh, answers to questions at those higher levels. Negotiations, love this, this is a great technique, right? So what are the facts that we're dealing with? What are you asking for? Uh, what are the possibilities from that? And then build up to those uh, why questions or those evaluation questions. It's really interesting in negotiations, you'll really get to see ultimately why people want what they want instead of just saying yeah no you can't have that i don't agree with that or whatever you know if you're asking for a million dollars you're asking for you know two weeks worth of work or whatever it is I, you may not really understand why they're asking by getting to the whys and those higher level things you can probably better negotiate and then it's a great way also to study process maturity i know we have these sort of levels one through five but another way to do process maturity is to ask these different levels of questions right so what are the facts about the process what you know how are we comprehending it or are we understanding what the process is and it does how are we applying the process how are we analyzing and synthesizing? Are we rebuilding the process every once in a while? And how is that all working? Right. So great other usages for these questions. All right, now comes the participation section of our presentation. So I'm going to ask you some questions and you are going to tell me, whether through chat or just open your mic and tell me, what bloom level are these questions, right? I want to see how well you're paying attention. The, I don't want the answer to these questions. I want to know what bloom level they are. Okay, so here's our first one. What level is this? Level one. All right, level one. Okay, we'll see. I got some answers to this. So good. Thank you. All right, here's our next question. Which is better, Chicago style deep dish pizza or New York style floppy big giant piece pizza? Maybe you've never had either. Maybe there's another type which is better. Okay, we got people saying a level five, level six. Cody looks like he's thinking hard. <laughs> <laughs> Level three. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. I got answers to these. All right. When will Saturday Night Live be funny again? What level <laughs> question is that? <laughs> I think it stopped being funny many years ago, so... Level 200, there you go, yes. <laughs> Very good. All right. How much is one plus one? Okay. People saying level two. Okay, very good. We'll see. What causes men to go prematurely bald? Some of us on this call are suffering from that, right? Kids, yes. <laughs> or grandkids in my case. <laughs> Kids and grandkids. All right. Good. Some good guesses there. All right. What would happen if everyone asked more effective questions? Would 
we wouldn't have tabs. There we go. <laughs> Trying to lead to better job security. And then finally, did you enjoy this session? All right, level six, level six. All right, very good. Let's see how we did here. All right. Don't click. So yes, who is buried in Grant's tomb? Level one. I just it's it was it's just a basic, I just need a fact, right? And who is buried in Grant's tomb? Grant of course, right? And his horse. Uh, so uh, it's actually two people buried in Grant's tomb. So yeah, this is the kind of question I, I'm not looking for an evaluation. I'm not looking for an application. I'm looking for a straight factual data-driven answer, okay? Which is better, Chicago-style pizza or New York-style pizza? This could be either a level two kind of question or an 11, a level six kind of question. And this is the nature of effective questioning, right? You can reuse these things in multiple ways. Level two is if all I'm doing is taking the factual side of the two pizza styles and comparing them, then I probably have a level two kind of question, right? One has more crust, one has more sauce, What, right? If you're kind of getting into the feelings and emotions and uh, where you grew up and that kind of thing, now you're probably at the level six because you're adding in that subjective side of things. Uh, personally, I like Chicago style pizza. New York style pizza is pretty good, right? I like pizza, <laughs> right? So that's the answer to that, that question. All right, when will SNL be funny again? This could be anywhere from levels three to six, right? Again, if you're simply saying, what are the basic facts as presented by SNL, right? What are the types of jokes that they're using and um, you know how they're delivered in terms of timing and those kind of things, then you're probably at those lower levels of application. If again, you're sort of defining funny in different ways, then you could lead that up to a level six kind of question, right? So if you're talking about pure humor, um, you know, that's one person's opinion. Personally, I have a, a wicked, dry, British-type sense of humor, uh, so I may not find SNL very funny, right? Uh, I, I lived in Europe for a while, and it was uh, interesting. We went and saw um, the movie Airplane when it first came out, and as Americans, we were the only ones in the theater laughing because all the Brits in the theater, they had no clue about American humor, right? They didn't, they're just like, why is that funny? And we were just that's hilarious, right? So again, uh, could be could be any of those levels. Uh, not as straightforward, maybe as you think. How much is one plus one? Well, if all you're looking for is the answer two, then it's a knowledge kind of thing. Uh, but I have a friend who's an actuary who always likes to say one plus one is two uh, is three for higher levels of two. Right. For an actuary, one is not just a plain integer. One is one point zero 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 zero, however many decimal points they carry it out. So if you add the higher possibilities of one point nine nine plus one point nine nine, you may even get up to four, right? Or three point something. Right. So that is how are you applying it and how are you comprehending it? Uh, what causes men to go prematurely bald? This is a fairly straight one because it's analysis, right? You're you're looking at root cause kind of thing. You you could probably uh, extend that a little bit, but for the most part, this is just looking for that that sort of root cause, the the what is behind this uh, situation. And uh, it's lots of causes, right? Uh, you know, pa male pattern baldness and uh, genes and DNA and all of those things. Uh, what would happen if everyone asked more effective questions? Well, this is a level five kind of thing, right? You're trying to bring information, data information and knowledge together into a new view, right? And you're trying to project that forward. Hopefully this question would lead to further level six kind of questions, uh, you know, things like, well, why aren't we asking more effective questions? But uh, this would be just that start of that level five kind of thing. 
And then, yes, many of you got this right. Uh, did you enjoy this session? That is that evaluative, what are people thinking? And again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. And too often what we do is we write surveys at this level six level without having ever asked any of these one through five kind of questions, right? And then the problem is this level is very hard to answer in a nice objective way. You have to realize that a level six, all of your answers are going to be very subjective based on a personal feeling, the situation at the time. I'm not a big fan of those kind of surveys that kind of go to this, you know, are you happy? Well, it just depends on the day. No, today I wasn't happy with things. Yesterday I was happy with things, right? So you're catching people at moments in time. You're not necessarily getting a really good picture because you've skipped all of these levels. And again, where we started out with is Bloom told us you can't go from knowing nothing about something to having a mastery of it uh, and expect to be effective or efficient or uh, effortless, right? So very good. Good, good, good. All right. So questions, comments, concerns, frustrations, uh, ponderings, queries. What do you got for me? Yeah, so just real, real quick, Mike, I was just going to say, I know that it's past the top of the hour. I know a couple of people have had to jump sure. off. So I just yep. want to recognize time. And I know we started off a little bit late. So I appreciate everyone for sticking around a little bit later. So um, if folks do need to run, I understand. But yeah, please go ahead and ask your questions. Well, I have a statement, not a question. Okay, so. good, good. Uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I'm already applying. Yeah, Michael, this is this is really helpful. You know, it, it's concepts and topics and definitions and vocabulary that just going through the curriculum you're exposed to, but actually looking at this and understanding it, for one, there's immediate application for me in terms of going into assessments with different clients and customers asking those right questions because i think a lot of times you start out that foundation and then you just spiral out of control right. and and for me applying a lot of the best practices it helps form how i'm going to do an assessment or how i'm going to approach this or how i'm going to ask these questions or or even get to the point where you you have to do the synthesis and evaluation to deliver and add that value and so yep. yeah this this was really helpful really great material so thank you for that Thank you. Yeah. And I actually, if you, you may or may not have noticed, I actually use Bloom's questioning methodology to build this presentation. I actually use it to build all of my presentations because it's a nice flow, as you said, right? That way. Yeah. So thank you for that. Appreciate yeah, that. Sure thing. Other questions or comments or thoughts? I see some comments coming in the chat from Aaron saying, excellent talk. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Did thank you. Good presentation. Thanks. So thanks to both of you for being here. You bet. So I, the thing I locked in on, Michael, and you answered my question was the five whys. And it was interesting because you showed the levels with the different questioning words and the who, where, how, what, when stuff was at the bottom. And then the why was over at five. And I was thinking the same thing. Why being all the way over there stood out to me. And I was curious to know if that stood out to you too. And then you answered the question by basically saying with five whys and just jumping straight into that, is that the most effective way to go from an RCA perspective without knowing some of those particulars? And, yeah. and then your comment on the survey is interesting too with the experience management and some of the other things that uh, you know are kind of prevalent right now with asking people how they feel on the moments over time type of stuff. Yep. Yeah. Experience. So this this ties into things like experience management and XLAs and all of those kind of things that are coming to uh, light today, because that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about experiences. You're talking about moving somebody from uh, or understanding someone from those six levels of questions, right? That's what you're trying to really get to is where are people at those highest levels but you can't get there by jumping there or leaping there. You have to kind of build to that. Yeah, and Marshall, I see your your question. Yes, I will absolutely get this posted out and send the link and, to the recording. And Jeff, I'll send you the deck. You guys can share yeah, the deck awesome. out. That's great. That out on the meetup yep. too. Yeah, I yep. appreciate that. Um, I don't think anybody else has any other questions. I have another thing that jumped out, but I'll save that for a minute and make sure everyone else gets a chance to ask a question of Michael if they or any feedback if they'd like. This is Joanna. I just like to say, um, 
really great. I'm uh, just starting a new position and trying to get people to understand what process improvement is. I'm having to use all five levels. <laughs> <laughs> and building out a new program for everyone. I, uh, definitely, it's very useful. So thank you very much. So Julian, I think there's a couple of usages for this for you. First, going yeah. into a new job, yeah. ask, ask questions at all six levels. Exactly. Right. Start out with the factual questions, move yourself with your manager or your, your leaders up to those levels, you know, through those levels, that'll give you a better sense of what your job really is. And then use it then to help people understand those different things. And again, you may not necessarily always have to ask people questions, but if you have a set of questions that, like I said, I used a set of questions to build this presentation. If you have a set of questions that you kind of use to build what you're trying to por portray or to bring to other people, it gives you a nice rhythm and flow to get people to higher levels of thinking and understanding. Yeah. And it ties in really well with maturity models and stuff like that. So it does. Yep. It yeah. does. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. I have a few things I want to say. Not, not any questions, but a couple okay, statements. Good. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, I think that, um, uh, and some of you might have heard me say this before, that communication is one of the most important things in the world, and it's the root of a lot of problems, either miscommunication, lack of communication, bad communication, uh, anything uh, along those lines. And so something I've kind of naturally gravitated towards without realizing it through my life is this type of structure, starting with the, um, the basic data points and moving up. So I think uh, having this will help me a lot because I can actually make sure I'm adhering to that because uh, naturally in conversation, uh, tend to skip around between some of these different mm -hmm. steps. And mm -hmm. so having that flow between uh, uh, going going up the line, I think will be really great. I'm actually in support roles. And um, uh, so like I've, I've naturally kind of been doing a lot of these uh, um, lower level ones building up to begin with. And um, so I really am going to love having having this to make sure I'm adhering to it. And it made me kind of realize that some of the problems I've had in my lower level positions in the past, uh, um, uh, hitting heads with management, was that I'm trying to work my way up through this, getting to these higher levels. And um, they want me to stay confined to those lower levels when I want to naturally with my brain take these, uh, these ideas to their natural conclusions and, uh, and ask the questions and make the changes in the long term. But I, I tend to hit, I've hit a lot of those walls in the past. And so um, uh, it's, it's just good to actually have a foundation to understand where this is all fitting within. I tend to see this a lot with not just your presentation, but all the presentations in these meetings. Like I'm, I'm realizing that I'm thinking in uh, pieces and parts of all these different um, systems that, are, that exist. And it's just wonderful to, to, to get all the knowledge together and actually fit them within proper structures. Good, so thank good. You. Yeah, good, glad to hear that. And, you know, one of the nice things about this kind of model or this kind of approach is when you do hit those walls with questions, there are whole lists of bloom questions that you can rephrase the question i you know i said i was an educator for many years and one of the things most of my students really hated about me is i used that socratic um thing where they'd say well you know why did this event i taught history and you know why did this event happen in history and i'd say well why do you think it happened in history right i'd turn it right back around them or i'd ask things a different way to elicit an answer, right? So too often what we do is we end up asking somebody a question, they go, yeah, I don't know. And we accept that. Well, what this does is say, all right, let's back up. Let's ask a different Bloom's question. Let's ask it a different way or maybe at a different level. And maybe that'll spur an answer. All right. So good, good. Yeah, excellent. Other questions? Jeff, you had something, I think. Yeah. If I'm in line here and nobody else has anything else. Got a couple. One that jumped out to me when you're talking about knowledge management, Michael, and the DIKW model 
as you're maturing and standing out that as a practice, it's interesting to think about in the context of the levels of knowledge in the organization as you work through maturity or really getting to that level of balance, I think, with, and you can tell me if I'm making sense with this question. The question is really, do you see a linkage with Bloom level questions, I guess, in building out the maturity of a knowledge management practice? And I have maybe a part two based on your answer. Yes, absolutely. Because what happens is most organizations aren't doing true knowledge management. They're doing knowledge base management, mm -hmm. right? And when they say knowledge base, I think, well, you're limiting yourself to basically level one and level two information or data, right? Good knowledge management takes you beyond just level one and level two, right? It takes you to, to the six levels. It takes you up to wisdom. So yes, uh, it is really uh, in parallel or part and parcel of good maturity that you see an organization asking higher and higher level questions of themselves or even uh and it doesn't necessarily end up in knowledge bases but bringing or communicating to cody's point right communicating information at higher levels right why is this happening why are we taking this strategy why did we make that decision instead of just here's the decision live with it so it also ties into organizational change management Right. So it shows the maturity of those two things, knowledge management and organizational change management. Yeah, great. And that's what I was thinking and kind of getting into the whole point, which is really to enable more effective decision making and getting to that knowledge and wisdom level. Yep. So that leads to my second part of my question, which is strategy. We show that continuum from strategy backwards through transition to um, design and then up to strategy from your model, right? From one to six in that type of a context also. With thinking about the fact that you can't skip levels is a big part of what I'm trying to reconcile in my head and getting from that base level of knowledge. Having feedback loops through that whole model feels like that's necessary also so that the people that are making the strategic decisions and the perspective of where we're trying to get to in the future as an organization, how do you see that fitting together from this model's perspective and just recognizing that you can't just jump straight to level six in the context of senior leaders who maybe aren't as close to the users and the people directly doing the work? It feels like there's something that needs to be reinforced from a feedback loop perspective or something to make sure that that's actually happening successful in that context of this model and what I was thinking about as you were starting that slide. So that that is a follow on presentation I can do for you guys okay. um, based on the work of a guy named Chris Argris. Uh, and Argris is the one who talked about double loop learning, which is the basis of things like DevOps and what you're talking about. So, yes, it is not just simply I move up from one to two, two to three. I I may go up a little bit. I need to come back down and get some more clarifying questions at the level below. I made right. It's kind of like climbing Mount Everest. I go up and down a little bit through that through that uh, those levels in order to really learn because I may not get um, kind of conversation we were having with Cody, right? I may not get the right answer or I may not get the answer I'm looking for or one that is really clarified for me if I simply accept the answer to the first question. I may have to back up, take a different tact, a different approach, use different words, different uh, questioning levels to really kind of ferret out that that answer. Um, so, and that's the double loop learning, right? Is I'm applying the result of the question back into a different question. That Socratic method is another way to say that double loop learning uh, is really Socratic method. Right. So uh, and coaching. So, yeah, that that is very much part and and needed in all of this. Didn't want to wow. take people didn't want to blow people's minds too much today. I just wanted to <laughs> kind of introduce the concept and then we could do a follow we do a whole series of these things, Jeff, uh, follow on with um, how to do better knowledge. I have all presentation around that, how to do better knowledge management. So. Awesome. I welcome that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Michael. That was very much in line with what I was thinking. All right, see a couple more chats coming in. Um, Aaron's saying thanks, have a great holidays, you too. Thanks for being here. Um, Najib says, uh, how to cope with bias situations, question mark. Do you want to maybe come off mute, Najib, and maybe um, answer, ask that question in a little more, more detail? 
Yeah, somehow Michael have um, given the answer regarding the Socratic uh, way of asking questions that that uh, I think uh, could help to avoid bias. Yes. When, yeah, and um, that is that is really the way that you do that, right? Is you you kind of do an end around, right? <laughs> a bit of a, a rugby scissor move, and and uh, you know you like uh, approach things from a different perspective, especially when you're starting to recognize bias, and and you can recognize bias in answering because even though you're answer you're asking different questions, the person's always answering with the same answer. Right. So you can start to recognize that bias and then reformulate your questions, approach it differently, look at different levels of questions to ask them. And part of it is not just to get around the bias, but most importantly, that they learn that they have a bias. Right. So you're kind of teaching them again. That's a, that Socratic method. You're teaching them through questioning. And that's part of what all of this is really about is to people, not only for you to get responses and answers, but to help people learn to be different. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Michael, Robert, I see you're here and haven't heard from you. Do you have any questions or comments or feedback? Glad you could make it and just want to see if we could hear from you real quick before we finish things up, if you have anything. No, I don't. I kind of was partially listening and I was trying to deal with the event, the incident at the same time. So I can <laughs> participate some Mark. great opportunities for questions. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad you could be here and sorry to hear that uh, you're having to multitask. That's that's never yeah. fun. But I know that that's a priority, right? And par for the course. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap it up for the day? Okay. Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for presenting in our group. And I will take you up on that offer to have you come back and maybe do a part two or do a little bit of a series if you'd be willing. I have a sure, speaker yeah. potentially lined up. I'm trying to negotiate if they're going to be able for our next meeting. I'm trying to negotiate if they can be here for January or it's looking maybe like they can't talk till February. So um, we'll yeah, work just, on scheduling. Yeah, just let me know, Jeff. Just let me know. I'm happy to help. Yep, that would be great. Yeah, and I see Joanna's comment. Part two. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. All right, great. All right. Well, I'll officially end the recording. I, I will post this recording once I get it uh, converted and uploaded to YouTube and get everyone out the link. And now, yeah, Michael, if you can send me your presentation, yep, we'll so do that. Yep. Awesome. We'll get all that available for everyone. And just appreciate everyone being here. Have a great Christmas and a great holiday. Um, look forward to seeing all of you in 2023 and we'll continue to spread the word and can continue to grow the group and give back to the ITSM community. So I'll stop the recording. Thanks for being here.